Okay. So we're in the classroom now. All right. We were in. We got all that stuff set up. Uh, first off, I wanted to really quickly show everyone over here how I have my camera set up. I'm on manual mode. Uh, one one hundredth. Uh, uh, shutter speed f16 100 ISO next I am going to go down to uh, the speed I'm going to change it from continuous shooting to self timer two seconds you guys can't see this but it'll be on the video later then I'm going to go up here, which is where the exposures are, and now I'm going to use the little wheel. I'm going to increase my exposures. So now, if I took a photo, it's going to not line up because I was holding it manually, but if it was on a tripod, it would take those three photos at different exposures each, uh, in theory from the exact same angle, except for little tripod wiggles, and therefore you have your final output. So now let's look at how we can stitch these together in Fusion. We talked about jamming them together in Luminous. And this is Fusion. I like to start with the simple interface. And I'm going to start by loading images. Here are some, uh, these are just previous ones that I had created. And again, we're using JPEGs because they are faster. So this uh, this was not when this was not a necessarily great rotation, but you should be able to get the gist of it. So here you can see my up above shots, and here are my down below shots. And I believe this is uh, one that I shot with. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Five. This was twelve. So this was one I was shooting with uh, one coin between each tripod leg, and therefore shooting coins, tripod legs, and in between them for a total of twelve. And it was giving me just slightly too little overlap. So that's why I switched to using two coins and going with 18 degrees. And holy crap, what's going on? It's trying to load these just in order without any control points. So now what we have to do is start stitching these. Fusion has, we go to an advanced it brings up the panorama stitcher. Here we can see all the photos. Again, these are just the JPEGs, and therefore they're going to go really fast. If I go to control points, you basically have two images that you're viewing at one time. Over here we have zero, uh, which is one, and you know, code language always starts with uh, zero. And this is the same photo over here. If I go to one, you can see how it's a neighboring file. Uh, that's slightly off. And you can already tell that uh, these photos did not have enough angle. It's at a glance, uh, you can't really tell where they stitched together, right? Well, if you look very closely, there's this wall of uh, mosaic tiles that kids made, and here's the other side of it. So we're going to try starting with a little click over here. So if I click over here, one click instantly zooms me a lot closer and I can start moving it over and over and over. And I'm going to find one that's high contrast. If you're looking for contrast in lights versus dark and contrasts in color. And this little preview, uh, you can see how it'll smash it into uh, more contrast and different color. So this little eagle or whatever is a good example. And now if I just click over here, it'll probably do a pretty good job of auto finding it or mess it up. So what we often have to do now is look for it. Where is that eagle? It's right there. There it is. There we go. And then we go to the next one. So this was a bad example because it didn't have enough. Uh, it didn't have enough overlap, so it was hard to find something and eyeball it. And now we have this beautiful map of America, which is a little easier to find control points. So now, if I click here. I'm just going to get this little tip of, let's just, now let's go and get the tip of Maine. Maine, yeah, Maine. Now if I click here, it should just auto-locate it. 
Yep. So I didn't have to do any work. It just automatically figured it out. And if it says there's an error, chances are you should just delete it and try again. And keep trying until the computer algorithm says uh, it made sense to it. Let's get the best state, Washington. Let's look over here. And see, it instantly found it. Oh, I was doing one thing wrong, so I gotta go back. Uh, I did not have auto add on, so when I clicked those two control points and it didn't see where they were, eagle, eagle. This is still one of the clunkier parts of the interface, but hey, it's free. Where is that eagle? So now, just like there. So we got the eagle. So now uh, I'm going to manually add that one and it creates this control point. So now I turned auto add on, so for the next view it should just automatically work. So that tip of main, I'll just modify it a little bit, and the tip of main. And I found it and added a point. We can just go through here real fast and add more and more points. I like going for sharp angles. Uh, you know, stuff like windows are really good. Trees are your enemy. We should cut down all the trees if we live in a panorama oriented society. Good move to your mm -hmm. Uh, let me see. There's this car that's above the stroller, and we can just see. Boom, pick a tree. Yeah. See, like, this is an example of one where I didn't have enough overlap. And not causing me grief. I think I'm gonna get this little reflector on my daughter's stroller. Uh, right there. I found it and added the point. Next up, maybe this red car. That looks good. Back tire. I'm just gonna do this uh, first round of 12 on the horizon. And now we're getting some windows, right? Windows are open. See that? Nice high contrast point. Shut up. Oh, this, this seems problematic. Yeah. So what are we looking at? First off, it flipped it. That's not. That's not pleasant, but it's uh, you know, it's just a computer, man. It's not as smart as humans. I think this tree is this tree. So this window. Is this window? Does that seem right? Sure. Yeah. Let's give it a shot. Okay. Yeah. So is it smart enough to figure out that one was this when it finds the point? To figure out what? It can it figure out it's flipped now that you found the point? Usually it can. Once once you start uh, having it figured out, it, it undumbs a little bit. I'm going to go for this sign that's over here. I was practicing on this. This is another thing I would suggest if you're getting, if you're getting into this for the first time, which is you should, in fact, uh, practice on some JPEG. Don't dive right into the fancy EXRs. It'll cause you sadness. EXR is coming from now. Excellent. Yeah. Let's see if I can find this car. Nope. So I'm going to delete that point. Let's see. This tree is that tree. So I'm going to bite the bullet and map to some trees. Trees are not as good to map to because the, if it's a windy day, they're going to be moving around a lot. Um, we're almost all the way around the 360. 
So if you were doing this with your three panoramas of 18 photos each, one in the middle, one above, one below. Uh, so see, we're all the way around. So what I would do is stitch all the ones in the middle, including going from this one all the way back to zero. So the 12 and one are stitched together. And what do we have? So why are some of them upside down? It's just, um, yeah. I think uh, to some extent it's To some extent, I think it's Luminance's fault. It outputs it that way. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You didn't like uh, turn your camera over and like this. No. Um, I did not. And again, when I have this attached, I have it attached. You have the little grippy part if you're on the cannon facing down. So I would do it like this. Um, and I just drilled holes in this with the metal and stuff uh, so that I have some amount of flexibility. And so you would do first, so you would do 1 through 12 and then 12 stitched back to 1, or rather 0 through 11. Then you would do uh, 12 through 23, then uh, 24 through 36. Yeah. And then uh, you would go back and stitch the top to the bottom. So you would end up having zero, uh, you would have zero over here, and uh, 12 over here eventually. And now you'd see like, this is why it's good to keep the horizon in the shot on the high ones and the low ones. Because I have this little building now that I would be able to map over there. But so for now, we're just going to start with these ones. Uh, can you do more than one point pair? Uh, yeah, but uh, what I found is you want to like, you know, you don't want to waste too much of your time doing these points. Especially since once it has something to grab onto, it can actually start generating some of these points itself. Um, also, one thing that when you're doing this with ESR, JPEGs record in their metadata the camera lens that you were using at the time. So when I loaded this, it knew 19 millimeters, uh, 1.53. Uh, chances are, if you have a lens, it's going to be like this one is an. 18 millimeter through 135 millimeter. I'm going to sit somewhere around there. And so you generally want to be zoomed way in. Like you don't want to be zoomed out. Or you don't want to see far away. You want as much stuff. And if you ever are in the mood to buy more expensive equipment for your camera, another thing you might shell out for is an 8 millimeter lens, which is going to have a wider field of view and therefore you could take a lot less pictures. So I've seen uh, stuff on the internet where somebody shot with an 8 millimeter and got uh, the whole thing done in like six photos. So anyways, we have all those control points. Now we're going to hit a line. It should start running crazy things. We don't have everything aligned, but it'll hopefully figure out at least the ones that we did stitch. And we should be able to to see in real time as it's trying to find some control points. So I think I can show you an example of uh, one of my first successes. I do, again, stress, uh, consider doing this on uh, JPEGs first, just because uh, it's kind of like baking bread. You're going to have to do all this work, and you let it sit for six hours, and then you discover that at the end of six hours it was a pile of crap. And you can't uh, undo that time. So start with your practice breads. From? It looks like that's because you have the webcam. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, s I'm, uh, I'm recording here. We'll try and figure out streaming on the break, I think. Come on, Chrome.
Again, thanks for everyone's patience. I'm uh, a little behind today. <coughs> Looks like a dolly for uh, All over our dolly. All right. Hold on one sec. I'm going to send myself over email a couple of these. Some of the examples I've been working on. So, Oscar? Yeah. Um, all this is real interesting, but I don't... How to use it in Blender, right? Yeah, I don't know quite... That, <laughs> that is the next step. So, I can show you uh, the cheap, crappy version of this, which is those mirror balls I used to make. So... So all of this is basically trying to get the high quality version of what I used to do with my crappy mirror balls. Uh, this is my blog, ogbog.net. Did this. Again, I plan to have all this, all these files on this computer, so I can show it to you a lot easier. The yes, love is. So now you can see Hugin starting to uh, stick these together. It's even starting to find points that we didn't uh, map. And uh, if we go to the control point, you can start to see how we have never touched this file, but it's starting to generate images. In fact, let's go to 12 to 13. So again, we never looked at these two, but Hugin is figuring it out with a little bit of starting help from us. So you don't have to, you only have to do like the middle uh, yeah, um, circle? Yeah, yeah, and in theory you might want to go through and uh, on any of those given points, after it's done doing all this processing, you can go into these individual points and modify them if perhaps they're wrong. So like you've, uh, you saw while I was putting these in, occasionally it would jump to the wrong choice and I would have to go and either delete that point and redo it or something. So there's still a good chance that it's making that kind of error. And you know, uh, it can get surprisingly messed up if, first off, you do have parallax. So if you did have your camera here and your lens is out here, that parallax does cause problems when you try and stitch it. And the other thing is like just the smallest, like oh, I touched my tripod, that'll ruin it. <laughs> um, but the ending quality ends up being a lot higher. A couple other examples of problems you have are. Uh, sometimes it uh, might have trouble figuring out how these lines connect, but usually it's pretty good. What's going to be way worse is if you shoot uh, power lines and telephone lines, because those are blowing in the wind, so that makes it very hard for it to figure out how they might connect together. Try using one of these in Blender. Uh, oh my goodness! It doesn't. Have, it 
doesn't have a zip file in this program. On the A manual grab of these. Again, thanks, and I appreciate your patience. This is an example of where control points would have helped because now it's I think having some some problems with where this guy is. But I think it's done stitching. So all this stuff that's wrong, we could go in and manually edit that. Uh, but let's just save it for now. So now you click output, and here you have varying ways that you can output this. So uh, you might want EXRs or low dynamic range. Uh, so if I click high dynamic range, it'll have this format. You usually want EXR. And you can see that this is a gigantic file. But let's hit OK. And then it'll ask you to save it. So you save it. We'll start batch processing that. We'll come back to that. Uh, for now, here's an example of like one of my first tests. Windows 8. Windows Photo. That's what I want. Eventually, Windows sort of weird. Yeah. So this is one of the test ones I shot, and this one was, you know, when I was initially stitching them, I often had lots of problems. So another thing to do, in addition to just shooting in JPEG to start with, is maybe just do the center row. Don't worry about the upper version and the lower version. Uh, if you can get the center stitch, then you'll have a starting idea of where you want to go with the higher up stitch. So this was. This was shooting with uh, only one coin per tripod leg, so 12 different versions. Hey, there's me. This is my living room. Now you know where I live. It's full of kid crap. He does have a kid. Not just yeah, I'm not just buying baby toys for myself. And any more. Any more. <laughs> Well, the instant your child hits Legos aren't going to kill them anymore age, everyone buys like a giant bin of Legos, right? That's what I'm doing. You can buy them on Craigslist. That's my goal. You find somebody who's been collecting them for decades and just... I won't realize how much they'll miss them. Yeah. So... So let's get a basic scene set up. So you test this with Cyclone. Hmm. 
on this one, we're going to make a basic diffuse material. On this one, a glossy. So now, we're going to go into our world setting and say use node. And under color, we're going to add a texture, which is an environment texture. And this will let us open up the file that we're using. In our case, this is going to be one of these EXRs. So we want these ones that are pure white, right? Oops, that's not what I want. Oops, that's the material. Background, texture. Yeah. And now you can see that it's pure white everywhere. And that's because this EXR has so much data stored from that environment that normally, like, a lossy file where it's jamming that into a 0 to 1 scale of light would lose. So now if we turn this down to like 0 0.001 oh, it's number lock Ew. I'll say mirror ball. So this is the mirror balls that I was making. And you can see how you get very realistic lighting very fast. And if you did this with an equivalent JPEG, and you tried to do something where you changed the strength, you would see how the JPEG or ping or whatever is a lossy format. You'll, you would say strength lower, and the shadows would get lower, but all of a sudden the sun gets lower entirely. Whereas here, as we increase the strength, the shadows understand what a shadow is supposed to be at a low exposure, and the sun understands what a sun is supposed to be at high exposure. Well, Oscar, I can show you. There's Something a trick like that. you can do for uh, using lower values. You can add a mask node. Uh, mask. Huh? Uh, no, just uh, just drop it, and then pr plug into the value set to power. Power. And now just adjust the second one, not the first one, the second one. You can uh, just raise it. Higher is lower value, plus your zero. It should be, so. It yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's good. Gives you more black control. You don't have to yeah. type in nonsense. Anymore. So that's the goal that we're trying to do, is we're trying to get this awesome file format with all this cool lighting info. But we don't want to see all these scratches from the mirror ball, and we don't want to see the, like, you can tell here that this is a low resolution file. It's a super dense, powerful file format, but it's only like 512 by 512. So in that sense, we're losing a lot of this beautiful environment lighting that we could have had. And that is basically, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to do with these EXRs. Yeah, uh, the low res is fine if you just start using it for lighting and don't want lighting. Yeah, and like, you know, a lot of the times in Blender, that's all you need. Um, but like you can see, I think at, hopefully at this point of the process you can tell why when you go on the internet and you want to buy photography, it's usually very, very cheap. And if you want to buy an HDR map, it's $60 all of a sudden. Uh, because uh, there's a lot more love that you have to put into an EXR um, and a really fine quality environment map. Um, so that's enough on that. Let's take a break, and when we come back, uh, somebody else want to show something? Anybody? Free t-shirt? Blender t-shirt? All right. We'll talk later. Pause. Yeah, Joey doesn't need any more. <laughs>